The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Oh, I love that song. All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa last session before uh, the Christmas holiday. Uh, I'm Peter Lindbergh, uh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And uh, today we have Janet Benian, um, a program director of anthropology and sociology uh, and professor of anthropology at Northern Vermont University. Uh, she specializes and is known for uh, gender dynamics or studies in gender dynamics in Mormon fundamentalist communities, uh, which practice polygamy. Uh, and today, uh, she's going to talk about recent research on polymory uh, and monogamy. Uh, so it's going to be a discussion on that. and It's going to be quite fun. So how today is going to work, uh, I'm going to tag in Janet in a moment, and then she's going to share her thoughts for about uh, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, and then we'll pivot to Q&A. If you have any questions, start putting in the chat. Call and you'll mute yourself, ask your question. If you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that and I'll read your question on your behalf. So that being said, let's see if Janet has the option to unmute herself. She does. Welcome to the store, Janet. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all being here. I know it's close to Christmas. You're probably wondering, well, shouldn't you be, you know, Christmas shopping right now? But I'm glad you're here. And I'm especially glad for those joining us from Europe. I know it's late, but it's going to be worth it. <laughs> I promise you. Um, what is it, 10 o'clock? Something like that? Yeah. Okay. So my idea behind this um, was to look with scrutiny on the standard that we hold up uh, called monogamy, you know, and um, how Western culture labels monogamy as the superior form. Although cross-cultural ethnographic research and historical data uh, state otherwise. And so I, I just want to put that out there as a challenge. And in order to uh, make this more interesting, I thought I'd give you some background about my own story, my own research and my um, academic journey um, because it, it's sure to amuse you and hopefully it will inform you as well. Um, for 20 years, I've been studying polygamous relationships, predominantly focused on the Mormon fundamentalist community. And some of you have, may have seen um, I'm going to just split the screen here for, or share the screen for a moment to show you um, one of the books that um, gives rise to about 20 plus years of research. Uh, this might be familiar to some of you. It's called Polygamy in Prime Time. And in it, I, I catalog 20 years of research among the uh, the uh, polygamous fundamentalists out in Utah, Montana, Canada, some in Mexico. And um, I lived with the polygamous in a commune when my babies were just quite young. I have two daughters and I raised them for the at least three years in this environment. And I was able to see firsthand the nature of these relationships and the intricacies and complexities of these marriage forms and how women would often um, put their own desires to the back burner, you know, it's a patriarchal group. But in, in the process, they were able to foster such amazing friendships with their co-wives, you know, where they would do amazing things, um, put up a um, sheetrock together and fix each other's plumbing and learn all kinds of things. And, they gained these um, really intricate friendships with each other, which I found fascinating. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe um, there are other such relationships that um, could be interesting for analysis. And so um, I started attending these um, pretty amazing non-monogamy conferences all over the world. And um, one of them uh, is where I met uh, a lover who uh, had been practicing polyamory a lot longer than I had. I'd never really thought of it until then, about two to three years ago. And um, in that experience, just trying to find a way to set up my screen here for a moment, excuse me. Um, 
I became interested in finding out whether the relationships in polyamory mirrored anything that I had experienced with the polygamous and also um, in my own experience, having been married twice and divorced twice. So I was really fascinated. And um, so I established myself as a polyamorous person. I had a lover in Europe, the other in Vermont. And this went on until recently, until COVID made it impractical. As some of you know who practice non-monogamy, COVID really does create some challenges for the lifestyle. And um, so a couple of years ago to learn more um, about polyamory and also to spend as much time in Europe as I could, I uh, got a grant to study polyamory in Paris. And just so, so that you know the definition, polyamory is consensual, ethical, responsible, non-monogamy, right? Some of you are nodding your heads, you, you're familiar with it. Um, it's multiple loves. And some of those loves are sexual, some of them are not sexual, uh, but that you are you know, loving in these relationships. And let me just repeat that again so that you know the definitions, consensual, ethical, and responsible non-monogamy, um, where you have many different lovers that you're honest with and they know about your affiliations with others. And so it's all above board, consensual. So in Paris, I found, um, and I, I just published a study on this group, um, that these particular Parisian polyamorous were very insular, just a small group of anywhere from 350 to 750, depending on which group you talk to, um, predominantly white, middle class, and they loved uh, gaming. So they were geeky gamers, um, atypical intellect, uh, feminist, anarchist, extinction, rebellion folk that would often uh, be seen, uh, you know, parading with the, the, the group of um, eco-friendly extinction rebel rebellers. They're into kink, BDSM, um, gender fluidity, and they're all drawn to multiple loving relationships, again, based on honesty, consent, and concursion. So for those of you who've never heard that term, it means that you're, um, you're okay with your lover's lover, that you are um, approving of that transaction and that you give um, support or sponsorship to it. So again, in my situation after two long-term marriages and divorces, um, this appealed to me uh, greatly. And so I began to write an ethnography and I presented myself to the subjects as someone who is an auto-ethnographer um, and uh, somebody who's both interested in it for myself, but also I wanted to hear their stories. And it was probably one of the most pleasant experiences of my life to <laughs> interview people in Paris, drinking wine and, and beer and coffee in the cafes of Paris, talking about their sex lives. It was really rigorous, hard, it was a hardship. Um, and I was paid to do it. So it was, it's a good life. <laughs> um, and so I wrote the ethnography and I was able to do a, a profile of these people. And I began to map the Paris multiple relationships in a network graph. And so let me just show this to you for your interest. And I'm going to put the link to this in the chat form later, okay? Um, so just a second here. I'll bring this up. So um, basically, what I wanted to show you was this network that we, uh, a, a few scientists uh, helped me with this, uh, one from the Cree Center and then a, a colleague of mine at NBU. And what we did was we wanted to, um, let me just enlarge this, to be able to express the nodes and vertices representing individuals within the polyamory network and all of their linkages with others. And so you can see here that there are clusters. There's a high degree of centrality and modularity for certain members of the group. 
And I had thought that I would ask, you know, whether it was males who had more modularity, centrality, density than females, because that's what we're told in um, psychological evolutionary studies. We're told that men are the ones who are better at this. And they have many years of experience in genetic hardwiring to have multiple loves. So this has been taught and is still taught by people like David Buss and others, Robert Levine, et cetera, Lionel Tiger, many evolutionary scholars. And so I wanted, I set that up as a question, as a hypothesis that it would be, in fact, um, men that had more centrality. But in the Paris community, um, it was proven that women had more modularity and stronger relationships. And it's not only that they had as many lovers as men did, but that they fostered these relationships, not only with their own partners and lovers, but that they created friendships and partnerships with their metamors. Metamors are those lovers of your lover or partners of your partner. And so that created a slightly different effect. And I published these findings recently in the UK journal Sexualities. Um, maybe you're familiar with that one. So um, I kept exploring, I kept looking at this question of not only um, polyamory for others, but polyamory for myself. And I began to uh, ask questions of, of my students and others of whether or not monogamy should be the standard. So my question is, um, is the monogamous standard still relevant in a free and liberal 21st century society? I thought that this would be a good question for a philosopher's group like yourself. And or are there other viable alternatives, non-monogamous alternatives such as polyamory that may be more conducive to a progressive, again, liberal uh, thinking society, uh, progressive thought and action. So let me just give you some background about this. And I have a beautiful cartoon strip that illustrates this uh, by Isabel Rosa. I think she's the author of it. But history shows that monogamy um, is a relatively recent invention. Some of you may be aware of this um, with the birth of agriculture um, and the attempt uh, by men to control the reproductive and productive resources and assets of predominantly state systems. So those of you who've taken history and anthropology are well familiar with this, but it's been sold to us as normal. And it's been seen as normal for so long that we rarely consider anything else. I know that in my Mormon uh, community, it was the standard, even though many of us come from polygamy stock. Um, about a hundred years ago, the Mormon church disavowed polygamy. And so we were raised monogamously, we were raised to know that this was our standard and that to deviate from it in any way was a, a sin. So it's been sold to us as normal. Um, being married or linked to one person is paraded as the standard in fairy tales, Disney films, politics, religion. Um, and one, as one of my uh, Canadian colleagues, Mara Strasberg, put it, it, monogamy is the emblem the motto, the, the creed of a true democratic, free and liberal society. So is it really? Um, we treat it if it's an, an innate part of humanity, but is it really a, uh, innate or is it a cultural invention? Um, recent evolutionary biology shows that um, monogamy may not be um, our, our closest affinity. Um, Mary Batten and various other scholars have shown that women are libidinous. We're very strongly related to bonobos chimps who are polyamorous. And so does evolution prove that we are monogamous or polyamorous? Uh, we also look to the ethnographic data for in, um, answers and the ethnographic record shows much more exploration than most people realize, including such sexual exploration as uh, polygyny, where one man is connected to several women, polyandry, where one woman is connected to several men, 
uh, and I've been, I've, I often say polygyandry, where there's a little bit of both, but there's also polyamory, multiple loves that may or may not ever express itself in a marriage form. Um, so there's many examples of this. The um, Iroquois, studied long ago by Henry Morgan, have polyamorous tendencies, as do the Cheyenne, the Sioux, um, the Inuit, the uh, Kung Bush people, Kung Song Bush people of the Kalahari. They all have polyamorous inclinations. The uh, Masuyo of uh, China, an ethnic group where women have many lovers, that is a standard there. Um, the Nayara of India have a situation where women can invite up to 12 lovers on average throughout their lifetime um, to visit them. And they, all they have to do is pay for the midwife fee. Um, so there's, there's evidence of polyamory in the ethnographic rep record. Yet uh, the preferred style is still a monogamous, exogamous pair bond. Uh, about 61 to 67 percent of the world's people practice uh, monogamy. Um, but is it right to hold it as a standard? Can we not suggest that it is a cultural practice rather than an innate or natural practice? Um, is it naturally more correct than these other forms? So though I have a lot more to say, I thought that maybe what we could do is um, I can contribute to the discussion of this with some more ethnographic and even evolutionary evidence if we should want to. But I want, I want to stop here and I want to open it up to discussion if I might. Peter, is that okay? Okay. So we can look at it in two ways. We could actually um, look at it individually as a preference, as a choice. Um, what are people um, attracted to? What are they, they utilizing in their own lives? And so we could look at that in a micro fashion for a few minutes. And then we could look at it in a macro question of which marriage and loving form, uh, which form of sexuality, love and marriage is most appropriate for a progressive, free and liberal society. So let's, shall we open it up? Sure. Uh, so put your questions or thoughts in the chat. I'll call on you and, I'll, and then you can unmute yourself. Um, you know what? Let's just go with the juicy one right away. Uh, Tom, you have a question about Jordan Peterson. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> hi, I'm Tom. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't want you to have a, a, a sort of a, a fake argument with Jordan Peterson here. But if, if I could see if I could paraphrase sort of his position. Um, I, th I think he would say that oh. monogamy is a stabilizing force in society because it it, it sort of pairs <clears throat> the angry males off with females and and stops them sort of acting like chimps and going around murdering each other um and i've until i sort of heard you talking i've, I've sort of believed him but but you, you sound as though you're living in this alternative paradise um so 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 what do you think about Jordan Peterson's position? What a character. Um, <laughs> where do I start? Um, I think his views are very narrow and obviously misogynist. Um, I think he's got a following because many men fear this, especially uh, if, if it's uh, a, a, a sort of polyamory that is polygynous, where one alpha male may have control over many or access to many females. You know, there's this fear that there won't be enough females to go around. That will cause crime, chaos, um, sexual frustration that will uh, facilitate all kinds of aggressive assaults and uh, rapes because the rogue male will be frustrated, therefore he'll, he'll rape more. So I've heard this argument before, and I, I think that maybe Jordan has never experienced polyamory. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it also may be a gender question. If you were you know, not only raised to think monogamy is the only solution in a democratic, free, stable society, which he says, then maybe you, know, you should ask 
I don't know if he's married or not, but does his wife feel the same way? <laughs> you know, and is, is there also um, the, the possibility that he is, has just in, has limited his experience, but his scope of what a true progressive society can look like? He has no ethnographic experience, that's certain. So I don't know. Yeah. If you don't mind, I, I want to push back, not, not in terms of s s sort of his ethics, but, but in terms of the, the wild imbalance there is between sort of young, hot people who, who can pretty much, you know, get any partner they want to a degree, where, you know, whether it's male or female, and uh, and have multiple partners and 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 you know have all the sex that they want, but there's probably I don't know seventy to ninety percent of the of the rest of people of us of me um, who who can't and and if if they're if they're not sort of paired off, it's more likely that they're going to get sort of left by the wayside surely I mean I I, I, I love what you're saying and and, it, and it, I find it liberating and, and I sort of uh, I believe you but at the same time I'm thinking about all of the, the 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 angry young men who are sort of playing video games in their parents basement and and they've sort of given up and 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 they're more likely to give up if um you know, there are a few hot males who are sort of uh, acting like the, you know, the, the, the alpha ape. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not sure I can respond any more other than looking, mm. you know, this Jordan Peterson incel movement uh, often raises questions similar to what you've just said, that what about all the men who are going without? And wouldn't poly forms foster that kind of division between those who can and those who do not have access? And I agree with you, it is a problem. This is, there's a, again, I mentioned Maura Strasberg, there's other scholars, all of them from Canada actually, who are part of, um, they've created chapters in my book, The Polyg Polygamy Question, and they raise some serious uh, challenges to not only polygamy, but in various other polyamory forms, because if widespread polyamory, polygyny, polyandry could create some financial concerns as well. Mm -hmm. Not only social and sexual, um, you know, possibly sex ratio issues that I think Tom is bringing up, but also financial concerns. So that could be discussed. And to, to risk making things awkward, because <laughs> every time Jordan Peterson's name gets mentioned, uh, I feel obligated to say this. He, he was my therapist for two years, for the record, before he became famous. And we did have a lot of conversations about the, the subject. But I will hold my questions and feel free to make lobster jokes in the chat. I won't tell him. Um, so uh, maybe, Gray, I will take you in. Hi, Janet. Thanks for being here. Um, I just had a question about if, uh, if there's ethnographical data on how monogamy went from this new practical innovation alongside agriculture to something of a moral institution that carries with it this perception of having existed forever. Yes, and this is something that I teach in my AMP 101 class. And so if some of you have heard this before, forgive me. <laughs> I don't think there's any of my students out there, but. It's basically following along the lines of intensified agriculture, you know, where storageable grains create the social central power. And that because a livestock on the hoof usually typically requires male labor, male, males then control that. So you've got private property, you've got livestock on the hoof, you've got um, land and, and, and um, all these very important resources that are controlled at this point in time, uh, at the birth of agriculture, by prom predominantly by men. And um, Engels writes about this. Frederick Engels is the first one that we, we know who, who alerted us to this. So that's the beginning 
of the necessity to control uh, production and reproduction. Because if you have control over uh, women through monogamy, you have control over their potential for uh, having children and that's uh, future labor uh, and also any agricultural activity they may be doing. Um, so to answer your question, it, it began around 10 to 12,000 years ago and the cultural institutions and ethnographic data illustrates that um, state societies that also utilize intensive agriculture have a heavy, heavy reliance on monogamy as the standard. Horticultural societies, hunting and gathering societies have a history more so of polyamorous relationships, trials, sexuality patterns, where you, know, you can have many different marriages and that women especially have the right to divorce at any time or be released with no stigma. And this is not allowed in these other uh, former societies. So maybe I, perhaps maybe <laughs> I've answered your questions a little bit. Um, yeah, if I can just follow up on that, I guess what I'm also curious about is when we know, like when we have the historical data on how monogamy came into being, what what goes into this cultural forgetfulness where people think, oh, we've always been monogamous, that's how we've always done things because it's the right way, it's the moral way. Well, I would like to open it up to anyone else who wants to answer that, but I'm just going to start with by saying this. In these same systems, these same state systems, you have religion that emerges, a monotheistic religion that sanctions the state. And, you know, they coincide. And so you have this dominant religion that suggests monogamy is God's will. And it also helps male control of the womb. <laughs> so um, those two things come hand in hand, you know, mono, uh, monogamous tradition. Uh, monotheism uh, coincide within these same intensive agricultural state systems. Thanks so much. That makes a lot of sense to me. Awesome. Uh, Evan, you're up next. All right. So um, I'm someone who describes myself as polyamorous by orientation or as an orientation, regardless of whether or not I'm currently practicing polyamory. And so I'm basically not at this point. And um, it's not necessarily out of a lack of abstract desire, but primarily because of something I've noticed, which is that polyamory seems to be much harder than monogamy to do right in at least two specific areas. One, the level of what I might call self-honesty or self-knowledge required of the practitioner. And two, the level of skills in navigating social dynamics that's required of the participants in polyamorous dynamics of various sorts. So I'm wondering about your read on that situation. Um, you know, it, I, I believe that's a common noticing of people who have practiced that uh, way of, of living for quite some time. And um, I'm, I'm curious how that uh, relates to your sense of, say, ideal societal dynamics um, in the sense that polyamory you know, brings with it a great sense of freedom, but then there's also the flip side of the coin of freedom is responsibility um, and, and how we can uh, enter into polyamorous interactions as mature adults. How do we know that we're ready for that? And, and just anything else that question brought up for you, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. Well, I had asked a polyamory a colleague of mine, Daniel Cortoza, to join us. Daniel, are you here? You might be best apt to answer that question. Maybe it was too close to Christmas for him. Um, but um, many of us find, a great question by the way, Evan, many of us find that it's all an experiment. <laughs> you know, I mean, and there, there are so many um, challenges uh, and um, hiccups to a smooth polyamorous situation. You know, for one thing, uh, what if both of, you know, what if you have a dyad and then the dyad has, um, you know, someone that one of the members of that dyad has an interest in expanding and um, opening up the relationship to another love. Well, what if they don't feel equally sure about that? You know, what if uh, the original partner isn't as much into it as uh, uh, the one who's found another love? 
you know, and so you you kind of you call that uh, monopoly, where really there's not an equal uh, experience um, and interest. And so it is harder. Evan is right. It's very hard because then how do you make sure that that uh, original partner is well cared for and loved and felt like they they you know have a stability in the relationship. And so it's not only the inequality of the dynamic, but there's also perhaps a different kind of definition of what love is. For many women that I talk to in polyamory, especially in the Paris community, when I ask them to tell me who they loved and or who, who their links were, I just said, who are you connected to in your expression of polyamory? They um, had fewer links originally because they said, we have to be in love with that person for me to say, his or her name. And when I asked the men, many of them said, um, how come you didn't have it? Uh, you didn't have enough uh, links connected to me. I, I thought that you were going to include this person or that person. And I said, well, but do you love them? And, and they said, no, but we have sex with them. So again, Evan, uh, it, the complexity is, is vast, you know, and I think for that reason, not only on the definition of what is love, but the definition of, of uh, or the parameters of what is acceptable in a polyamory network um, makes it very complex and very difficult. That's why you find not a lot of huge numbers, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the general population uh, uh, for practicing polyamory. It's very difficult. Any other, anyone else want to chime in? Uh, may I? Sure. sure. Oh, okay. I was, it's a long chat, but um, I when I, younger me uh, uh, in college dated E, and E um, was secretly polyamorous, uh, but she was afraid to share it because I guess she grew up with Catholicism, and like a uh, hardcore like New York Italian Catholicism. So uh, when I found out, um, I was very, all three of us were in the same room, and so. Um, but everyone had their clothes on. It was just like, it just happened. And so uh, we ended up, we paused our relationship very abruptly. Whereas with A, I met her a couple of years after E and A shifted from like Catholicism to like Buddhism, and Hinduism. So she was very open about uh, her, her lovers and also she was long distance. So I said, I love you from go. And with A, I was just able to establish a lot of foundations that I'm still friends with A today. And so maybe there's a cultural thing, like one spiritual practice, like in Buddhism, Hinduism, there's like the reincarnation, the idea that we have multiple loves in life, whereas other monophase are like, there's only one love and that's it. So I don't know. Thank you. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Um, this is adding to the complexity of how are you raised? It's taken me a long time in my life, having grown up Mormon, to actually accept my path to pleasure <laughs> and not feel guilty about it <laughs> you know so um it, it can be complicated you know um if you were not raised with that kind of sexual openness and and sex, sex education too we we didn't have a lot of healthy education in utah towards um self-actualization and sexual autonomy so if you've got a, poor, a partner who's hesitant or guilt-ridden about it, then that can really put the kibosh on a healthy polyamorous relationship, I, I believe. There's so many good comments. Which one do we choose, Peter? I, I know. Um, there, there's a question that's alive for me, um, which I'd like to ask, which takes on Evan's question. And I'm reminded of uh, Jeffrey Miller. Um, he did this tweet that he got dunked on. He said something like, uh, you need to have a high IQ in order to be poly. And everyone was making fun of him because it was like IQ signaling and stuff. But in reference to what Evan said, is there some uh, requirement for abstraction um, and dealing with complexity that makes one successful at a poly lifestyle? Because everyone that's poly I know and the people in the room like Evan, and maybe Gray, who just spoke, they're like really freaking smart. Um, so I'm curious if that and other characteristics are something that you find common with people who do poly well. So glad you asked that. Um, in my recent study um, in the Sexualities Journal, 
I found that the Paris polyamory group were highly educated, <laughs> you know, middle class, highly educated. And they even had uh, signs what in France they call the zebra characteristics, which is atypical intellect. Not only being able to juggle a lot of different ideas, but being able to confront uh, the and embrace um, nonconformist ways of loving without trauma, <laughs> you know, without the, I mean, it, you know, we, we, if we carry a lot of guilt and a lot of questioning and hyper analytic doubt in our mind, it makes it harder. <laughs> and this group didn't have a lot of that. They had um, already a nonconformist attitude. And when I say atypical, they were, they were able to see things differently <laughs> and perhaps in multitudes. Um, some people are actually better at it and more natural at it than others. I find that I am uh, somewhat of a, a reluctant polyamorous because I don't think I could handle more than two, two people, which has been kind of what I've been doing for the last couple of years. And I like that. But I know a, I have a girlfriend in Paris who has claimed to be a polyamorous uh, person from birth, that she's naturally this way and that she has a lot of love to give and that she's very much interested in expanding um, her loves on, along several lines. So I think it does take a, a certain type of person to have that ability to maintain multiple loving relationships at the same time. It's a lot of work for, for me. I think I've got my, my little, especially during COVID, right? I've got my little pod with my daughters and um, I've got, you know, my Vermont lover and that's all I can handle. Um, so it depends on the person. All right, uh, Amy, you had a, a question if you can unmute yourself. Hello, um, let me just get to my question. Hold on one second. Um, it was a while back. Um, I was wondering if you thought that the cultural lean toward monogamy is a reflection of the parochial nature of most people's lives. There seems to be a kind of cultural vertigo that scares most people away from doing anything that isn't super traditional. I love your question. I saw that. I'm, I'm trying to um, use the Colossus or the Corpus Colossum in my brain to read chats and also talk. It's tricky. Um, I hear women are better than men, but I don't know. Um, I think that you're right that we have been uh, raised to believe that this is the way we're supposed to love and that everyone else understands that too. So that there's a part of us that are nervous about going against the cultural standard and being nonconformist. You know, the, that parochial, slightly religious convention of going to the church and vowing to be true to that one person in this world, you know, and the, the whole, I mean, Amy, you must be aware of all of the many fairy tales and the stories, you know, not just Brothers Grimm, but all of the different storylines that are supporting such a standard so that everybody's living by that standard uh, coming from religion and literature and culture, then how are we going to be comfortable embracing it as a people, as a society? There's going to be a lot of judgment and stigma. Uh, for example, in my paper, I noticed that in Paris, there's a huge stigma against women having multiple loves. There's not a stigma at all for men to do so. You know what I mean? I mean, look at the presidents, Mitterrand and uh, Sarkozy. Many different uh, men have come out as uh, valiant and heroic even in their masculinity for having a lover on the side, a mistress. It's a French thing. But for the polyamory community to break that standard and have women, empowered women, I can't tell you how many fabulous women were in this group that are uh, amazingly strong and courageous. They, for them to admit to the Paris world that they also have many lovers, it's not done. You don't do that. And, you know, challenges would come up to them and, and walls. So I, I don't know if I helped to shed light on Amy's question or not. 
Any follow-up, Amy? No, that was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that. Great. Elliot, you had a question? Hi. Um, so in the uh, kind of idea that Polly kind of puts beta males at risk, it brings up the question of like, where, and this is kind of what the, those who are pro monogamy for this reason say like, um, that it, we have this kind of, it brings up this idea of like one's individual choice versus one's responsibility to society. Um, so I'm wondering both kind of how you see the importance of the latter in general, and then how would you kind of measure that? Like, um, I, I definitely hear what you're saying when you say, um, you know, that it's a bit of an unfair argument to say people should be limited because of the beta males and needing to protect them. But at the same time, what if they have a point? Like, what if it that does actually lead to whether it's fair or not, um, this group of betas, for lack of a better term, um, kind of lead it, be, falling down dark paths, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate question. You know, we don't want anyone to be left out, <laughs> you know, and will one love form or marriage form leave out a whole cohort of uh, beta males or others? Um, and there's, you know, certainly um, women who may be religious or conservative who don't want to buy into this. You know, I mean, when I think about one of my cousins or sisters, I've got 62 cousins and so many of them are unhappy in their marriage, you know, and I'm wondering, well, wouldn't they just be better off if they, if they could navigate a polyamorous situation and save their marriage, but that it's against their religion. And so they're going to be left out of that, you know, and then there's those who aren't even going to be able to access marriage, um, both may, male and female. Then there's the, the negative possibility that we can't afford such, uh, we can't afford to, to legalize uh, and regulate such marriage forms, you know, if they're poly, because it would be too expensive for the state. Um, so there's some definite negatives, you know, and also how could poly ever be a standard for uh, the whole society if, if it only is uh, not only accessible to a, a few, but only a few people can live it well. And so maybe it was never meant to be um, a part of the mainstream. Maybe it was always meant to be fringe. On the other hand, um, you asked, could it be good for society? Well, it's certainly good for women in many cases. Now, that's a question right there that might provoke a discussion because there's pros and cons to that statement. But let me tell you how it could be good. The Paris polyamory group that I studied, um, the poly networking was female driven. Um, you know, I saw what I call the, the agenic female sexual uh, agency. You know, women were finding freedom in it and being able to have as many lovers as they wanted for the first time, you know, and no stigma in the group uh, itself and uh, being able to foster those relationships and expand their network of friends through polyamory. They actually had more female friends, the heterosexual women who were enjoying high density and centrality in the network actually had more female friends through metam metamors and other associating friendships. So it seemed to be good for them. Um, it's not good for every woman. It depends on the situation, you know, especially a woman who feels like she's been left behind, you know, uh, where her, um, if it's a cisgendered marriage, heteronormative, then she may feel uh, that he has too many lovers and vice versa, you know? So it can't be good for the person who feels left behind. There is a, I think it's, it may be spoken or unspoken. I don't know, I heard it once in the polyamory community that when you have a, a group of individuals navigating their loving relationships in a polycool, which is a, the uh, small polyamory network pod, if you will, if there is someone who is hesitant, then they should be the one to call the shots and so that they will never be abused. Now that is 
the honor system that is the goal, but how often is it misused? So you bring up some good points, Elliot. Any follow-up question, Elliot? Um, I mean, I think, you know, one can't argue that anyone and women in particular kind of feeling more agentic and having more choice uh, is a good thing. Um, but I almost think like, because we come at least Western cultures so much from like a, an individualist mindset that we might just be thinking about like what matters to me personally without a consideration of kind of the social side. And so I think, you know, maybe finding some way to balance that so that one is making their personal choices, um, but still kind of has the space or the, the idea embedded or offered to them that um, there is a larger societal component to consider. And that doesn't necessarily mean one is or has to be restricted uh, but that, and, and that's really more a question than a suggestion, but like, how do we find that balance between kind of individual freedom and the recognition that we are part of a, a collective um, and that those are important considerations? Boy, I wish I could, I, excellent question. I, I do recall one group, one polycool, a woman and her two husbands in um, uh, outside of Paris, who had achieved what you're saying. I think that they created that equilibrium in their lives. And the two husbands had their lovers too, in a kind of a constellation form. But the hub were was this woman who created this um, amazing domestic haven for everyone. And they had eight kids among them. And they got along really well, fabulous communication. They've been together a long time. And they shared childcare, even the metamors. So the husband's lovers would help with childcare. And so this woman was the hub and she kind of set the tone and temperament. If there was going to be a new lover, if her husband was gonna bring into the picture a new lover, she would like to meet that person and discuss with them their intentions and tell them who she was and let them know, well, frankly, she's the queen of the castle. And with that kind of strong centralized female role, she was able to create this harmony and rule structure that both gave rise to individual freedom for herself and her husband, but also had a very stabilizing effect for the whole hub. I really admired that. Thank you. All right, um, let's go with Rosie. Uh, you had a question and then we'll go to uh, Pranab. Um, Rosie, you're up. Hey, um, sorry, I'm just finding my question because it got lost in the list of um, yeah, the chat's on fire today. Uh, <laughs> it's exceptionally active, so the, the topic is a, a juicy one. Um, you asked a question about uh, monogamy uh, in uh, any society. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't get much sleep yesterday. Um, so yeah, I just wondered, because I'm, I'm polyamorous myself, um, so like I'm pretty, I'm kind of looking at this at the angle of like what's good about monogamy. Um, so I was wondering if, um, in your opinion, if you can think of any like societal setups that could happen uh, where you think monogamy would actually, like universal monogamy would actually be a preferable option. Oh, <laughs> oh you're, you're that anti-monogamy, huh? <laughs> I mean, your question is asking in what, in what universe would monogamy be preferable? Yeah, like universally. Well, I don't know. I, I, I think it worked well for me for two marriages. I had two long-term marriages that um, equated to be about 20 years. And I, I really thought they were, they're both very fabulous men who I love dearly. 
and I wonder if we could have still been together had we tacked on a little <laughs> polyamory on the side. But no, I think that for the time that I entered into it, monogamy served me very well. I had uh, two children. I had a supportive, well, sort of supportive husband <laughs> and his family and my family in a traditional Mormon gathering of temple marriage. And so for, for at least, I would say about seven years, it worked really well to support me in my goals as a young mother. Um, but I think that that was because I was raised with such a strong religious background. And so it made sense to me. So if you're asking, where does it work? Well, a strong religious background, you know, Catholic, Mormon, Protestant, whatever. Um, really believe that this is your eternal mate. You know, with Mormons, it's your eternal mate. You're married for time and eternity, so it better be damn good. Maybe that's the problem. I think that's why it didn't last. But there's a religious context, an economic sharing context that makes sense to you. You know, the division of labor, where there's an agreement, uh, a non-duplication of labors, maybe the traditional one where the woman is at home, the man works, you know, so that there's this agreement. Um, in those contexts, monogamy might be preferable. Any follow-up question, Rosie? Um, yeah, I mean, as it, to me, that seems like all of that's achievable while not being monogamous. I mean, um, I'm married myself, and um, I plan to have kids with my husband at some point, and uh, we've been polyamorous the, the whole time, so I I don't necessarily see exclusivity being the same thing um, as commitment in that way. They, they don't necessarily have to go together at all. Um, so I, I was thinking kind of more in a situation of like it within society at large, because um, in your introduction, you were kind of mentioning that um, uh, monogamy, I guess, if you will, made more sense kind of in the past, like um, maybe when we had like more hardships and we needed a more rigid structure for society to function, but that we don't kind of uh, live in that context anymore in the, the 21st century. Um, so I guess I was just kind of ask, asking more about the, the differences that you see there and how like preferable monogamy is from like societal context, like from time to time, place to place. Well, let's look at it through efficiency modules, you know, models, excuse me, being efficient. What does that mean? Um, I see things differently. I see things like you do <laughs> now. But at the, at the time of my young marriage, my first marriage, I was really very, very content to, to use the monogamous structure to my advantage because I felt like I was a strong person in the marriage and I felt like I could say and get what I needed. But so many marriages are not like that. You know, one of the faults of monogamy is that in traditional heteronormative patriarchal, you know, uh, the woman is under the thumb of the man more often, and she doesn't have a female network or other lovers or other friends because she's controlled more decisively in that structure. And that's why Betty Friedan says it's got to go. You know, back in the 50s, she wrote The Feminine Mystique and said monogamy, traditional patriarchal monogamy is the worst possible thing that could happen to a woman if the conditions are patriarchal. But I saw myself in that context as a, a free woman, uh, educated. Um, you know, my mother called me controlling, maybe that helped, I don't know. But <laughs> the situation at the time, for the, at least a se the seven years, worked very well for me. So again, let's just say, whatever works for you, do it. You know, and without the restrictions of numbers, you know, if many loves works best for you and your, your partner partners, great. If monogamy works for you, um, as far as society is concerned, let's get back to that question. If we can, in the few three minutes that we've got left, maybe we could expand it to five, five minutes. What's best for society? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Uh, and just to 
the time wise are you okay for maybe 50 minutes after uh, the hour because sure. yeah it seems like this is pretty alive we, let's keep going yeah and do you want people to jump in randomly for that that question or do you want me to pick another question that's me um, related can we can we just have anyone who has the courage to <laughs> sure uh, adam maybe yeah I, i'd be interested in saying something about that oh ronald uh yeah, you're, you're, from your, you're from UFT, aren't you, Ronald? I am, yes. Yes, yes, okay, great, great, great. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> well, see, I, th I think that when people talk about the impact on society, um, think back on the whole debate about homosexuality. There was this, all the stuff about how it was going to be a disaster for society if you allowed <laughs> homosexual marriage. This was such obvious nonsense, but the reality of it was that it's people thought that it was bad for society because peop other people would be doing things that they didn't approve of. And I think with polyamory, the stigma of polyamory is what makes people think it would be bad for society. When there's obviously, as, as you so rightly said, in the history of humanity, this just perfectly non nonsensical uh, except in so far as in polygamous society where only the men get to have many partners, that also means that many men get absolutely no partners if that is indeed a strictly enforced rule. But if women have many partners and men have many partners, the whole business of leaving, letting these poor incels stew in their solitude <laughs> becomes completely... Uh, beside the point. Yes, some people will have more difficulty finding partners than others, but that's true in a monogamous society um, just as much, if not more. Well done. <laughs> oh, thank you. I have a comment, but Adam had his hand up too. Adam, did you want to say something? Adam Golden? No. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm glad that Ronnie had, had something to say. He, he already said most of what needs to be said, I think, here. But I think it's just what can be more of a cultural standard is just a norm of being less controlling. And I know it's kind of inflammatory to put it that way because it's kind of like just calling monogamous people controlling. But I mean, I think it's basically the reality that like, look, everyone can develop like a, like a sick desire to control other people and like look at the society that we live in. So I, I think, I think um, coming at it from a political angle like that and about the psychology of being controlling sidesteps the whole thing of like well what if i don't have time to have three partners it's like that's fine just like don't be controlling you <laughs> i, I to, to me that's the cultural in terms of what's good for society would be a less controlling society and that like the the like how, how do i manage my time people thing is kind of like a, a a red herring thanks adam i have to say and there's some comments on this for those who've lived uh, in polyamorous situations time is the key <laughs> and you mentioned that if we were to thrust this on society, we would all be running around polysaturated. Uh, we wouldn't have enough time to do all the things that we wanted to in life. We'd be so consumed with our relationships and managing and navigating our relationships that who's to say that we get inventions done and what would happen to our research? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have time to teach. I don't have time to do research. I've got three lovers and it's just, sorry. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say, along with Ronnie's, may I call you Ronnie? <laughs> we don't know each other, but um, is the, the other societal issue is um, if you are living a stigmatized sexuality or marriage form, it's rough. And I've been studying polygyny in Utah in this way. And something amazing happened, which opens up the question for polyamory as well, is this last year in Utah, the state legislature voted in favor of decriminalizing poly forms of marriage, which was a victory for many uh, of us scholars who have seen that, you know, stigmatized sexual forms and relationship forms uh, keep people in the, in the dark. And some of the abuses relating to these forms uh, don't come to light. And so if you, if you decriminalize, if you open it up uh, to let people live their lives uh, with um, the su support from helpful agencies, 
you know, uh, social work agencies so that if they need help, then this is a good thing. So this one uh, legislative act occurred in the United States and I was shocked because it, we've been waiting for it to happen in Canada twice with the 2010 and the 2006 polygamy trials that I was a, a part of and it did not happen. So Utah is more progressive than Canada. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to let you guys know about that. <laughs> um, is there another question, Peter? Yeah, uh, we can uh, maybe field one, two, one or two more. Um, there's one that just got posted. Give me one moment. Uh, Lucy, you had a, a question. Yes, it's and it's it's another field. Actually, it's um, as um, coupled or as polyamory. We uh, we are parents sometimes. So, have you have any information on how uh, they can take care of kids? So, I know some people in in the area here where I live that uh, I speak with um, polyamorous, and they're just like, "Oh, my dream is to have more kids." and and I figure out that they will be raised by the community. I like that. I'm not sure it's realistic. So maybe you have some observation that you've made. Well, there is this group in San Francisco that started in the 70s to use their polyamory for the express purpose of raising children in a better way, in a better world. And they set up in these Victorian houses with multiple families and polyamorous relationships, typically of um, something like two women and three men. And they would raise, you know, gardens, raise their marijuana, <laughs> um, and raise their children. And though I live in Vermont, I had expected more of this in Vermont, and I, I haven't been able to find it. But it's, it's, it's something that, that is a very Vermonty way of thinking of the world. You know, you can, you can raise a garden and tap the maple. And, but these relationships um, formed a coalition in San Francisco and they had a newsletter that touted their successes in parenting. They said that, you know, we can have one or two people go out into the world and make money and then the rest can raise the children. The four parents at home will be there for the children so that whenever there's a problem, a child will always have at least one or two parents available for solving their problems. And so the ideal is that it works. I have to say that the organization uh, closed down in 89 and there were some foreclosures on the expensive homes and I didn't hear much about that. But I do know that in P Paris, the polyamory group does practice, uh, the few that have families do practice uh, child sharing, um, not only between the parents, you know, among the parents, but the metamors and any, anyone else who's available in the network. And they say that it, it's very satisfactory. Um, I do this, I did the same thing as a monogamous wife. I had uh, girlfriends and sisters who helped me out. They were my metamors, they weren't my co-wives, they were my sisters, but they were available and we worked together. So I think that same thing can happen in a monogamy situation if you have access to a network. You know what? It makes me uh, see that I have um, I have this idea that maybe polyamorous relationship relationships are, are less tables. So there's a go and back and forth with the, the adults around the kids more than in a monogamy situation. So I see that now. You're right. They are less stable. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. So. Um... We're approaching the end, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling called to sneak in one last question. Uh, and this is a question I asked Daniel Schmachtenberger when he was the sense maker in residence here, because uh, he, like yourself, he experienced with monogamy and, and, and poly. Um, and the question I asked is what sort of personal or spiritual benefits he got from each of those engagements? Um, do they emphasize certain characteristics, uh, uh, certain characteristic traits that one might not have? I love that question. I, and I'm sure there's some comments from all of you about your own experience, but I have to say, that's, that's the best question I've heard all night. Um, 
for me, the ideal of polyamory has transformed me. You know, whether or not I actually have more than one lover at a time seems now to be less relevant than the mindset that I've adopted these last several years of learning about it, which is expanding my heart to be able to love many people, not, not just sexual partners either. I'm finding that when I was in a, a Mormon monogamous relationship, I had trouble with male friends. You know, the culture frowned on that, right? You're not supposed to be close to men. And, and I wasn't sleeping with them. I just wanted to hug them and be with them. They're people, they're humans. And I was shut off from that. So in polyamory, I can expand my community. I can expand my heart in a way that, that makes me feel that I'm experiencing some kind of spiritual revolution, you know? And so that's, that's my take on it personally, but I'm sure the others have something to say. Um, maybe uh, if anyone feels called to do one or two shares, you can just popcorn style, just unmute yourself and then we'll, we'll formally close out. this is why we had like the structured Q and a approach because it's uh people are gun shy just unmuting themselves but i, I do yeah, think I can, it, oh sorry, sorry. okay I'm trying to like yeah, chime so. in and be the good improv member um yeah i can share just that in, in my experience of being a polyamorous person um i've just really gotten to a place of like deep felt sense understanding that i don't have any sort of ownership over other people. And um, even if I was ever in like a monogamously structured relationship again, I could never go back to this place of um, people owe some, some section of their lives to me or something like that. So that's, that's something that's been like really impactful for me. I think the most impactful part of practicing polyamory in my life. May I just this say one last thing, um, unless there's another one? Um, um, did you call me, Peter, or? Oh. No, I, I didn't call you, Hawk. Um, but Janet, um, yeah, feel free to close us off with. Um... I think that what we can possibly get out of this is that any society that limits our ability to love others in whatever way is, is, is fulfilling to us is a, is a bad society. Um, and the knowledge that one size doesn't fit all. Um, there are many different um, sexual and loving and marital relations out there that, that are limiting and stifling to people. And then there are others that are uplifting and enlightening and expansive. And so in a progressive, liberal, free society, we should have laws and cultural tropes and norms that give allegiance to the, this variability and the right to choose the love that is right for you. So that's all I have to say. And thank you so much for listening and being, uh, uh, I really appreciate you, Peter, for hosting this. It's been an honor. Beautiful. Uh... I'll make some closing thoughts in a moment, but Janet, thanks so much for coming to Stoa today. We'd uh, love to have you back. Uh, people were suggesting conversations, perhaps Janet with Jordan Peterson, who knows uh, on, on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> I'll be sure to send the, the good professor this video. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, everyone, um, thank you for coming out today. Uh, for those who celebrate, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and happy holidays, and we'll see you in about a week at the Stoa. Bye, everyone.